Welcome back to Beautiful Moms. Thank you all for being here today. And happy November 1st. Halloween is over. We did like four different Halloween events over the past couple of weeks, so I'm ready for November and Thanksgiving. <laughs> so um, we have an amazing day planned for you, and we're so grateful that you're here today. Um, first, we're going to have Flick do her two-minute scripture share, and so I'm going to pass the mic over to her first. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Hi, guys. So everybody got that um, Halloween hangover, feeling a bit puffy, a bit tired. I woke up like that this morning, wondering what the heck I'd sign myself up for. But hey, here we are. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to share a scripture um, that's quite close to uh, my heart. Uh, I've got a little thing I've written, so I'm just going to read it. <laughs> when I was a little girl, I remember being in the car with my granny, my Devon granny. She lived by the sea in Devon, hence the name. We're sitting snug, all cooched up on the back seat, and we were driving from the wilderness of the moors down to the sea. The car meandered down the winding hill, and all of a sudden, we could see the wonderful seaside in front of us. It was grey and stormy, and the sun was nowhere to be seen. But suddenly, there was the most wonderful beam of light shining onto a section of the ferocious sea, lighting it up like a magical shard of a gazillion diamonds amongst the dreary greys and angry weather. Then my beautiful granny, whose arm was wrapped around, looked at me deeply into my eyes, and she said in her soft, warm, and loving voice, that's God, lighting up the dark. I remember this like it was yesterday, so clearly and vivid. And throughout my life, I've gone back to this moment so many times. As an, artist, or as an artist setting out to paint after college in my early 20s, the sea was calling me, calling me to paint. So I moved from London to Cornwall, eight miles from Land's End. It was the most chocolate box, pretty village and the sea, and, uh, by the sea, and I started to paint. It was this, my granny's voice, that spurred it on. And, that, uh, and at that point in my life, I didn't really understand that it was actually God calling me to paint his creations and filling my soul with creative energy and talent. In times of darkness, I always go back to my granny in the back of the car and my favorite verse, which reflects just that, which is John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is how I try to live my life and fill the souls of the people around me, dancing with the light of life. Ta-da! <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm already crying. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Flick. <laughs> um, I just, I just want to just say thank you to all the table leaders for sharing their hearts and their faith with us. It's just such an amazing gift that we have an amazing group of leaders, and what a um, ways to only have them share with their tables. I love that Flick was able to reach all the people in this room today. So I love giving, giving the opportunity to our table leaders to do that. So thank you for being so brave and volunteering to share your heart and your faith with us. So next I'd like to introduce Kristen Bonham, the women's pastor here. She's married to Chris Bonham, who um, I know personally very well because he and my husband are very good friends. And our, um, so Kristen's granddaughter and my daughter are also in the same uh, preschool class. <laughs> so um, little Reese and little Ashley. And they were also, by coincidence, Elsa and Anna for Halloween during the parade on Tuesday. So, uh, but Kristen has an amazing message to share with you about God's grace today, and uh, if you would just welcome her and uh, hear her heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Am I on? I'm on. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, I am so happy to be here. I love this ministry. I started, before I was even on staff, I started in our ministry here as a table leader. Um, years and years ago, I think my kids were teenagers, and now they're married and have their own kids. So this is a picture of my, not my whole family, because they'd be like this big on the screen, but um, these are all of our grandkids, and um, it's a bit of a circus, which is why none of them are looking at the camera, really, except for Emery in the right. <laughs> 
Um, and then I, I got to go to Israel um, in March, and it was a, uh, a gift, I feel, that God set me up for that I was totally unprepared for. I didn't really ever have a desire to go. Um, I, I just, not that I didn't want to go, but I just wasn't, it wasn't something that I was dreaming about and, you know, thinking, oh, it would be so great to be able to go to Israel and see where Jesus walked and, you know, go follow all those pilgrimage and pilgrimages. Um, but God set me up through a friend, and because it was her that invited me, my husband was like, you need to go. Um, and while I was there, he, it was like he took me to Bible school for 11 days straight, and it was the best, most amazing thing that I could ever have imagined that I never thought I needed or wanted. So um, I'm really sharing from a new perspective that God gave me while I was there. Of course, we got to see a lot of really cool things um, and experience a lot of really cool things, but the biggest thing was that he just changed the way I see him and the way I see the Bible and when I read it. And so I'm going to share some things about my trip, and then we're going to dig into a passage of Scripture um, and just look at it, hopefully, with new eyes together. So I have a few pictures of my trip that I figured I'd show you before I start. This, can you all see behind, like, am I in your way? No, okay, good. Um, this is the Sea of Galilee, and this is actually right on the shore of Capernaum where Jesus started his ministry, um, and, so, and we actually got to go across the sea on a boat, which was really cool, um, and set our, put our feet in it. And then the next one is just the countryside. This is actually looking down on Bethlehem, and then Jerusalem is really far in the distance. Not too far, but you, you can't really see it on this picture. So this is looking down on Bethlehem, on the city of Bethlehem. This is in Palestine. And then the last picture is just uh, that, the yellow is mustard seed. So when you read those verses about mustard seed, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, um, you will say to this mountain, move, and it shall move into the sea. And mustard seed is kind of a weed over there, like... It's a plant that they, they if, if it, it goes, if they put it in the ground, it literally goes everywhere. And when Jesus talked about that, you know, the, the word for that is parotzing, that our, that the mustard seed goes parotzing across the land. And so the picture that we were envisioning in that moment when we were, you know, hearing about mustard seed and seeing it everywhere, it's everywhere, um, is that our faith just spreads and goes parotzing across, touching everything it comes in contact with when we have faith as a mustard seed and we believe in God. So those are just a few pictures. I have about a thousand on my phone, so uh, if you want to see them, we can, you know, go have dinner and spend the night together and have a slumber party. <laughs> we'll look at them all. Um, so anyway, I want to talk about a story that we probably, many of us have heard before um, about the prodigal son, but we're going to change it up a little bit because of the way that, um, that we are going to look at this passage together today. But we all come to God with ideas of what he is like. And, you know, my ideas of God were very warped. And no matter what yours are, if if you had, and most of the time, those ideas are formed by a father figure or your father. Like, however that relationship was or is, that's, that's probably having a big influence on who God is in your life. And you may have a great relationship with your dad, and, and you may think, you know, have, a, have a, a more accurate picture of who God is, or you may have this picture of God as kind of the the, the weekend dad where it's all fun and gifts and, you know, experiences because um, of your, your family situation. Um, you may have a picture of God where he is policing you and just waiting for you to mess up and then he's going to nail you when you do, um, you know, or, you know, that rewarding good behavior, punishing bad behavior, and if you were like me who was in trouble a lot, um, that was the extreme, was that tense relationship because you were not doing right, so there were not a lot of rewards. So, but no matter what our past experience and no matter what our view of God is, we have just a small glimpse 
And we cannot understand or see God clearly or right without Jesus. Whether you had a great relationship, you, you have a good view of God, or you have a, this work, we, none of us, really can understand without Jesus. He is the one that paints the picture of God that is the most accurate view of who God is. And even then, we can't wrap our heads around it fully because, until we experience and see him. Um, when I got back from Israel, one of our SEU students, I was, I was like, everywhere I went, I'm like, just shut up, Kristen, just stop talking. Because I felt like I just wanted to talk about it all the time. I just could not stop. It just was so real to me. I wanted to share it. And people would ask me a question, and I would find myself 20 minutes later, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm going away. I'll stop talking. But anyway, he asked me what my biggest takeaway was. And my mind was just like, cat, you know, filing through all the things that I learned and trying to figure out, like, what was the big thing that I got? And really, it boils down to this, that I have been conditioned, and I think our culture and our country and our side of the world is conditioned to read the Bible and look for me in the story. How does this relate to me? What is God telling me? What is the direction he wants me to get, you know, to take? What's the promise I need to hold on to? You know, where, where am I? We feel conviction. What it, it's, really, it's all about me. We read the Bible and it's all about me. I need something from God. I'm going to read the Bible. I need God to show me something. I'm going to go read a passage. I need a verse to hang on to during this time when, you know, I'm struggling and we read, which is, that's not bad. That's not a bad thing. But it's all about me, and the filter is me, and this common um, way of thinking is called the Western lens. We are viewing God's Word through our Western eyes. Me, 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 me. And in the Middle East, they have a different filter. When they read the Bible, they look for God. What does this say about God? And I'm sure at some point, like, I, I also do that. But it's hard to shift over from that me mentality because that's how we're conditioned. But they read the Bible and it's all about who is God in the story? What does this say about God's character? What is God doing to reach out, you know, reach through these, this situation? What is he displaying about his love for us? And so, you know, how does, how does this verse or this passage help me overcome my wrong idea about God? How does this give me new understanding about who God is? It's all about God, and this is the Middle Eastern lens. And so that was the biggest thing that I took away from my trip, and I hope that as we go through this passage today that's very familiar, that you will see it with new eyes, with a new lens, and that it will help you as you do your own Bible study and you read Scripture to put that before the me lens. Um, so rabbis or teachers in the first century told stories to communicate the divine. In other words, to communicate godly things. So these are the parables that Jesus t shared, and he was not the only one. This is a, a common practice that rabbis would do. They would break down the scriptures and make it applicable to the common man. How does this relate to your life? How, does, how do you see, how can I show you who God is in a more relatable way that, that you will understand? And so rabbis would, they all had their disciples. They each, you know, there were two major schools of teaching or thought on interpretation of scripture. So they were either with one or the other. And a lot of times when the Pharisees were asking Jesus questions and kind of testing him. They were trying to see which school of thought he was coming from. They were trying to nail him down to this way or this way because if, depending on which one they came for, they were either he was either with them or against them. And so um, the religious leaders in that day were cruising along, doing their thing, they have their disciples, they're, they have their followers, they're telling their parables, and then Jesus comes on the scene and he shakes everything up. He just comes in and paints a picture of God that they have never seen before, that they cannot even wrap their heads around, they cannot imagine. 
he is beginning to indicate that he is the Messiah and they don't like it. In fact, the verse that Flick shared earlier and, um, from John 8, this takes place when Jesus is on the temple steps. This is about the la in the last week of his life. And he stands up and he says this to the crowd. And everybody stops and listens. And all the Pharisees are like, oh, dang. He is saying that he is God. No way. They didn't like it. So, so it's just interesting that you shared that verse today. I love that. Um, but one of the main things that Jesus did, or one of the <laughs> habitual things that Jesus did to really shake them up, is he used women, story about women, stories about women to communicate godly things. And this was a big no-no at that time. And so, you know, he would tell parables and he would talk about women in these parables. And the reason that that was not in, encouraged or even a, w widely practiced is because in that day, women were thought of as less than. And so I want to give you a little bit of history here. The culture was such that women were not spoken to by religious leaders. They would go to the synagogue and, you know, the, the priests and the rabbis would talk to the, the men and the sons, but not the women or the daughters. There was a whole teaching by a very prevalent voice to the Jewish people that is very negative towards women. And so what happened, you know, in the Old Testament, women are set up by God to do courageous things, to be leaders, to be bold, to upset things, to change history, to, I mean, if you read any of the women in the Bible in the Old Testament, it's like, man, they were rock stars. Like, they were doing things that I don't know if I would have in me. And then something happened. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are 400 years between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew where God is silent. There's nothing written, nothing recorded during that time. And that is the time when these teachings started to be prevalent where it was pushing down women. And then Jesus is born. And this is what Jesus is born into. And so when he comes on the scene, he wrecks every idea that is not of God. He upsets every practice, subtly sometimes and blatantly at others. And so um, Jesus, when, when he starts talking about women in parables, the women are lifted. They're like, oh, we've never heard this before. Jesus is talking about us. But guess who else is lifted? The men are lifted. Because when women are pushed down, men are pushed down. In a way that the way they view women is so wrong and up, upset from what God planned the way women view men is wrong and upset. And Jesus comes in and he lifts everyone he comes in contact with up to who God is. Every interaction he has with women, he is lifting. He's the woman at the well. He lifts her. She runs back to her town. And there are all these people who have shunned her and rejected her are like, what are you talking about? You've seen the Messiah. We're going. Let's go. They all run to Jesus. They hear him. They're lifted. The disciples who were going, what are you doing talking to this woman? Why are you even talking to her? She's a Samaritan. She's unclean. And she's a woman. And then they end up staying there for three days. The disciples are now lifted. That's what Jesus does. So I hope that as you read through the Bible in your own Bible study and you come across these interactions with women, you will see that lifting and you will understand what I'm talking about. Um, so many times Jesus would tell multiple stories to illustrate the truth about God and, and he would, in those stories he would include a story about a woman. So in 
Luke chapter 15, we read about the good shepherd, because remember, we are looking at this with new, a new lens. We're looking at it with the Middle Eastern lens. So in your Bible, it probably says the lost sheep, which is focused on what is lost and who is lost. But in our, what, the way we're looking at it is we're looking at it to find God. And in this story, God is the good shepherd. In the next story about the lost coin, it's the good woman who searches and searches and searches until she finds the coin. And then the last one is the running father. And so we're going to talk about that um, today. So in Luke 15, verses 1 through 2, in the New Living Translation, it says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to hear Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So he's breaking all the rules. He's going outside the bounds. And these um, religious leaders were just, and Pharisees and teachers were just, being religious and judgmental. And Jesus was like, I'm going to shake you up. I just imagine him like karate chopping all of their ideas that they built their, their um, control and, and uh, position on. So in Luke 15, 11 through 24, I'm going to read this story about the parable of the running father. Jesus told them a story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About that time, his money ran out. A great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. So the image of this story, you know, this, this is not something that actually happened, that Jesus was saying, hey guys, the other day I was watching this thing happen down the road. This is all parables. He is relaying and telling stories about, let me show you who God is. He's like the running father. And this was monumental for everyone hearing. So we hear, we read in those first two, two verses that, um, tax collectors and sinners and his disciples and all the women. And, I mean, it wasn't just Jesus walking around and the 12 disciples following him. There were probably hundreds of people that were following him. And then when he got to wherever he was teaching, then thousands, we read about, you know, 5,000 came to hear Jesus teach. 3,000 came to hear Jesus teach. So the crowd is full of all kinds of people, including the Pharisees, who were like, what is he doing now? I'm going to go check out Jesus and see what he's doing now. Who's, who's on Jesus' duty today? You know, like, who's going to go see what he's saying to the people? But the thing that was monumental about this is that Middle Eastern men do not run. And Jesus is talking about a father who, when his son comes to him and says, I want my share, basically what he's saying is, I wish you were dead. 
He's saying to his father, I wish you were dead. I want my money. You are dead to me. He takes his money. He takes his share. And he goes off into the world, which was like going to Vegas and living from this little Jewish boy who probably got up every day and said his morning prayer and his evening prayer. He goes off and lives in Vegas and lives to the hill, spends all his money. And Jesus is painting a picture of a God who will accept us back no matter what we've done. Because that was the worst he could have done. He feeds the pigs, which are unclean in the Jewish culture. And he wants to eat their food. He is at the lowest of the lowest. And Jesus is saying to the people, God will come and find you. He will look for you when you turn around from whatever you're doing, whatever distractions you have, whatever sin you are stuck in, whatever shame you are under, he is looking for you and waiting for you. And when he sees you, he's not going to sit here and go, here they come. Here they come again. He runs out, hikes up his robes, exposes his legs, which is shameful, runs, which is shameful. Running was for children. And he goes out and meets his son from a long way off. The, ta- the, the father takes on the son's shame by exposing his own. The other part of this that was just, it, it, when we look at this, the father who turns to the crowd, so if the, if the son is coming from a far, from, he sees him a long way off, he runs out to him, and then he turns, if we go back to that verse, He says to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. The father starts running. There's a bunch of people running. There's a bunch of people going out to meet him. Why? The son would have been dead to the entire community. This is not just a family thing where he shamed the family, he went away, he lost all his money. He shamed the entire community. So the community... To them, he was dead. So when the verse says, my son who was now dead, who was lost is now found, my son who was dead is now alive again. That's what that means. So there's a, a tradition, a ceremony in the Jewish culture, culture called kazaza, and it's a Jewish cutting off ceremony. And if a Jewish son lost his inheritance in the world, When he returned to his village, he would be cut off, thought of as dead, and they would perform this ceremony in front of him. And so basically what they would do is they would go out to where the son was coming back from. When they saw him, the community would go out to him, and they would drop this clay vessel at his feet and yell, you are now cut off from your people. You're dead to us. So the running father knows this. This is probably not the first son who's ever done this. This community, you know, is familiar with the customs. They're running out because they see him coming. And in that practice, the father would never go. He would stay home. The mother could go, and she could wait to see what was going to happen. Were they going to cut him off? Were they going to allow him back? But the father would sit and wait for the news of, of what took place. Not this father. Not our father. He runs out, and he gets there before the crowd gets there. He was not the only one running. 
the village would have been trying to get there to perform this ceremony to, to bring judgment on this young man to determine what you've done is qualifies you for, for disownment. But the father got there first. Mercy runs faster than judgment. In fact, I know I forgot you have like fill in the blanks. So the first one is Middle Eastern men don't run. And the second one is the son would have been dead to them. <laughs> and the last one is the most important one. Mercy runs faster than judgment. Oh my gosh. I am so judgmental. I don't mean to be. I don't want to be. But I am. That is like my sin default. But when it's coming at me, I want mercy. If I did something, I'm like, mercy, mercy. Don't judge me. Don't hold it against me forever because I reacted wrong. Or don't, don't punish me. Don't withhold your love from me. Don't withhold your time from me because I messed up. I want mercy. But I find myself not extending mercy as much as judgment in my own life. I want it towards me, but how much do I extend it towards others? I'm guilty. James 5.13 says, Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful, mercy triumphs over judgment. So here's some things about this whole story that just brings home the message of who God is. Once the people fall, saw the father embrace the son, they followed his lead. They knew that he was accepted and restored, and they all joined the party. I mean, it literally, can you imagine it? Like, they're running out there. They see the father embrace the son and kiss him while he's trying to get out. I'm so sorry, Dad. I, did, I messed up, and I just make me a servant. And he is just kissing him and hugging him and embracing him. And all the people are like, oh, okay. <laughs> and he says, go get the ring, go get the robe, go prepare the meal. We are celebrating. And they're like, woo, okay. They went out there because they were stuck in there. This is what we do. And, God, and this father showed them a better way. He showed them, this is what we're going to do here. We're going to embrace. We're going to restore. We're going to celebrate. And they were like, all right, let's party. <laughs> Only the father could restore the son fully in his family. The prodigal's father broke all of the customs. He broke all the rules. What customs and rules do you have around who God is and how he will handle your situation or you? Because Jesus is saying right here, he breaks all the rules. He breaks all of our worldly mindsets, all of our religious ideas that don't fully align with who God is. He ran. He showed his legs. He forgave before this cutting off ceremony could be done. So Jesus is blowing up the picture of who God is in these people's minds. He is just busting down ideas and walls of who God is. He says things about God that they have never heard. What are you, what are you saying, or what is Jesus saying about God that you've never heard? What is, he, what is he showing us in this passage that you need to hear today? That maybe you've walked away, maybe you feel like this thing that you're dealing with that you can't seem to overcome is too much. 
And God is sitting up there going, you better figure this out. And he's not. He's saying, bring it to me. I, even in our everyday lives, our coming and going, the things that we're hearing that maybe are not even directly about us, but, but they're things that impact us. I have a few situations that are so heavy on my heart right now that I just don't understand. And I realized yesterday that I am so tense with this burden. And I need to go to God and say, I don't get it. And I need to let him embrace me and help me see him through this and carry that for me, but I don't. I just feel that tr stress and that tension rising, and I think I have to do it on my own. It could be that. Only God can restore us to him through Jesus. Only God can fix our picture of him. He sent Jesus to take our shame, and I I'm, I wanted to share that, that what I'm going through with you because I think sometimes we think shame is like this big thing we've done or our, our idea about God is like this big wrong thing when it, it's just those little things that sneak in too. It's all of it. It's the big, it's the little, where we just think we have to do it on our own. This son thought, I got to fix my life. I got to I got to figure out a way to eat. I got to take care of myself. And then he was like, okay, my solution is I will go be a servant in my father's house. How many of us think that way? I will just go be a servant to you, God. I am indebted to you for the rest of my life, and I deserve nothing. And God comes to us and is like, oh, you just don't get it. I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to restore you fully to sonship. I'm not going to make you be a servant. Only God can do that. Only God can bring us back to that place with him and restore us where we never thought we could be restored. So that's all I've got, and I'm going to pray over us now. Jesus, I just thank you so much that we can come to you and see who God is through the stories that you share with us, through the words that you have given us, through the passages, through the parables. God, you, you have shown us who you are. And I just pray that as we leave this place today, we would see you differently. We would read your word and Look for you in it instead of our default, which is to look for us. Because we don't have anything that will help us fix our lives. We need you to fix us. And so, God, I just invite you into the discussions today. I pray for every woman that's here. I pray that you would minister healing and hope and restoration. I pray that we would celebrate those returns, God. I pray that we would be able to celebrate the God stories that you're already doing, the things that you're already moving in, God. And I just thank you for complete restoration. I thank you for Jesus who restores us to you. I pray you'd bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.